So today I'm going to uh, continue from where I, uh, I left off last time and um, sort of build um, uh, richer languages on top of um, the simple stateful languages that we looked at last time. Um, next, next key. Right, so uh, a quick recap from last time, we looked at how to embed a, first a deeply embedded uh, a language in STAR. A, uh, we looked at this Veil assembly language and its VC generator. And then we saw how to embed uh, effectful languages and reason about them using refined computation types. And I showed you this Dijkstra monad for state. Um, there's a second example there. I mentioned it briefly at the end of, the, of yesterday's lecture about information flow controls. Um, and um, uh, I encourage you to look at the notes. I think it's a pretty cool example. I don't, I don't have time to cover it in detail. I'm going to skip it. Um, but uh, if you're curious, check out the notes and uh, ask me questions about it. So today, what I'm going to start off with is um, is trying to do uh, describe how you can enrich our model of state with a richer memory model. So, uh, if you remember what we had, where we reached yesterday was a proof that a of a very simple program of um, that a stateful program where the state is just a single integer that a that a program called double correctly doubles the state, but for realistic programs, you want the state to be more than just a single integer. Um, and uh, I, I presented this slide yesterday where we actually, what we wanna do is to have programs that manipulate uh, a heap, for instance, and have type references into a heap and, uh, and, you know, um, and to reason about the effects of the program on the entire heap, not just on this single monolithic uh, uh, integer state. So today we're gonna to see how, um, we're gonna start by seeing how we, um, we, uh, we can model such a typed heap. So the basic idea is that um, if you notice yesterday, what we did was we, we developed this, uh, this state monad that was parametric in the type of the state. There was a second index called uh, that, that uh, I instantiated to int that was going to tell me what the type of the state was. But I can instantiate that type to whatever I like. Um, and in particular, I can instantiate it to a type of a, uh, of, uh, to a model of a typed heap. And uh, one simple model for uh, how to build a, a typed heap is, is, could be something like this. Like I, I'm going to model a, uh, uh, a, uh, a, a reference as an abstract memory address. And my address is going to be, I'm just going to take um, uh, an address to be a, a NAT. And now a heap, I can model in the following way. So I'm going to have a, a, a field called next address that tells me the, um, the, the next free address, the point at which I can do an allocation. And my heap is then going to be a map from addresses to um, optional pairs of a type and a value at that type. So this is, you can think of this in some way as a, uh, a partial heterogeneous map from addresses to values. So at every address, I may have a value at a different type but this, this dependent pair here, this sigma type here, tells me the first component of that pair tells me what type I have at a, at a given heap cell. And the map is, a, uh, its codomain is an, is an option because you know, I, um, at, uh, I need addresses at which I can, I can do some allocations. Um, so it's a partial map from addresses to these, uh, uh, these uh, heap cells. Now, um, I'm going to decorate this with an invariant that tells me that for all addresses that are greater than this high watermark next adder, the map at that address is none. So I have so this is actually giving a semantics to this next address field, telling me that well I can allocate at next address. I'm sorry, map. is there a mistyping of h instead of a? It says h is greater than next address, next oh, address. Yes. But sorry, yes, yes, it should be a. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, sorry, there's another question in the chat, Nick. Um, mm -hmm. What does the abstract keyword do under the hood in this example? So this, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid uh, on my slide here, I'm, uh, I'm kind of using a, a sort of pseudo F star in some sense. So this abstract keyword is, I'm just saying, uh, so the way you would do this in F star is to use an, a module boundary and to, and to not expose the implementation of heap to a client. I don't want, to, I don't want a client of this module to know that a heap is in fact implemented this way. The heap is going to eventually be implemented as some um, 
um, you know, as a primitive heap in ML or OCaml uh, or, or, or C or something. So abstract is just saying that a client should not rely on the representation of heap, but this is its model. Okay, okay, good. Okay, thank you. Likewise, I'm going to say the references are, their model is, a, is just a, a, a uh, natural number, but I'm going to tag it as abstract so that you can't do things like address arithmetic. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's, uh, if you want, I think I have. Um, uh, there's there's a paper here that describes uh, uh, in greater detail how we model heaps. Um, uh, you can follow that there. It's um, um, uh, yeah. That this is this is you know the, the partial story in some sense. So uh, so that's my that's going to be my representation of of heaps. Uh, and now I can give you some abstract predicates to reason about the contents of, of a heap. I can say, well, uh, um, I can write a predicate called contains that's going to tell you if a uh, if a reference R is included in a, in a heap, if it's if it's currently live in the heap. And that's just going to be uh, a uh, defined this way that the that the ref the value of the reference is um, is less than the next adder. And that the heap at that location is 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 currently uh, allocated with sum. Um, there are probably ways in which I could s simplify this. I, I I I for instance I think I may not need this conjunct um, because if it were greater than next adder, this invariant would tell me that it's uh, that it's that it's none anyway. Um, uh, and then to, to select an element from, from a heap. So what I'm going to do is in, 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 in specifications, I'm going to use these, these, um, uh, these, uh, these modeling functions, select an update that let me uh, read the content of the heap at a particular reference and update the content of the heap at that reference. Just, so to select a, the contents of a reference from a heap, I need to know as a precondition that um, the heap actually contains this reference. And if so, I can, uh, project the value of that uh, reference from this heap map. And this precondition is going to tell me that what I get back is actually a, a, a cell that has been allocated. And I'm just going to return the value that was allocated there. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, and in fact, this, this reference, this, this, um, uh, this, this invariant here tells me I should have made it a little bit clearer. It's it's not only telling me that the heap is uh, that the reference is live in the heap. It's telling me that at that heap cell, I have a value of type T that is suitable for this reference. Okay, so that's important. That's what's letting me return a uh, a value of type T from uh, from the selector. Okay. So once I have um, uh, once I have uh, these uh, these heap models, so this uh, this kind of uh, abstract heap model, then what I can do is to derive effectful operations to um, uh, to read and and um, and and write uh, these reference cells uh, um, in in, a, in an effectful manner. And what I'm going to do is to uh, is to uh, for instance, I'm going to expose a a uh, an operator called uh, um, uh, called bang, and what bang is going to do is 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 given a reference R, it's going to be a um, a uh, a computation in the state effect returning a T, while requiring as a precondition that the initial state H contains my reference R, and it's going to tell me that in the final state my heap didn't change, and that the value that I returned is the value of the heap at location R. And the way that I'm going to do this is I'm, I'm going to use this imperative action that I de derived earlier, the one that is going to let me get the entire heap. I'm going to get the entire heap, and I'm going to select this value from it, and uh, this is and, and return that value. So that's uh, so I'm going to use the, the, this kind of uh, this uh, uh, this this primitive operation that I defined uh, using a reflect yesterday to get the entire heap. I'm going to um, uh, use that here, and then use that to project out the the the, the value that I want. And now the rest of my program can use this bang instead of using get. I'm going to hide get from the rest of the program and only provide to, the, to, to my ML-like clients the ability to uh, bang, the dereference, and to, to write uh, 
and, and an assignment operator to write a reference. And I can give them both these, these kinds of specs. Okay, is there any question about that so far? Yeah, another technical one, kind of technical. Uh, e, yeah, the condition says that H0 equals to H1. Mm -hmm. What equality is assumed like reference equality? Oh, uh, this is provable equality of H0 and H1. Yeah, like how do we prove equality for abstract heaps? So provable equality is available at, at all types. Uh, so this is, uh, so here uh, in this particular case, uh, um, I'm, uh, the, the state monad, underlying state monad is only doing a, a, a get, it's not changing the heap at all, right? So I can show that, in fact, in this case, this provable equality is also a definitional equality, like H, the H didn't change at all. So this is, this is an equality in prop, it's not a Boolean, not a decidable equality, it's a provable equality. Yeah, right, I understand, but still I'm kind of puzzled about equality between especially APEC and abstract values as heap is supposed to be abstract. On the other hand, even if we have access to the, you know, the model, then we have a map there. Yeah. And yeah, what? Yes, do we, do we use uh, uh, yeah, extensional equality on? In this actions? case, I'm not using extensional equality. I'm telling you that the heap didn't change at all. Like it's uh, the, the heap. Yeah, was... Okay, in this case, it's obvious. In case of update, we still kind of have equality on heaps where the heaps are kind of different. Here again, I'm telling you that the heap, uh, I'm not again using extensionality here. I'm saying the heap was updated exactly by updating this, uh, um, uh, the initial heap at this one location. I'm not using extensionality here. All right, yeah, thanks. Now in practice, because these are two, these very primitive functions, right? They only uh, write is only writing one ref cell. Now, in practice, you may be, you know, you may, if you say you write two ref cells in a different order, um, you won't, you probably don't want to say exactly the order in which you wrote these ref cells. So, in a typical specification, and I will show you some of these, you will, your post condition will not specify um, the relation between the initial and the final state as an equality. It will usually specify it as a relation, telling you what changed rather than giving you an equality. But for these atomic operations, I can actually be precise enough to give you an equality. Yeah, makes sense. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so I, you know, I, I'm not going to show you these here, but you can uh, see in our in our papers about uh, you can enrich this model to actually give you um, allocation and even freeing a reference. Uh, uh, so. Uh, uh, those things are, are are possible to define. Now, um, it's a, a slight interlude. So now, uh, you know, you can with with this uh, uh, assignment and um, and dereference, you can start to program with ML style references. Uh, uh, but you can also layer abstractions on top of it. So so for instance, if you um, uh, uh, if you wanted to uh, reason about the effect of reading and writing references, you, you can reason about them using an abstraction, for instance, like uh, there is this notion of, um, of, uh, of lenses to reason about bi-directional data access. Now, a, a lens is a pair of functions from uh, uh, between uh, two types, A and B, such that from an A, you can extract a B, and given a, a, a B and an old A, you can construct a new A. So it's a way to kind of uh, uh, read and you know sort of project a B from an A and to update an A with a, with a new B. Um, so uh, so that this is uh, you. Some of you may be familiar with this from uh, other function programming languages. Now, one thing you can do with with uh, these lenses are are these these pure structures, but you can actually build um, uh, stateful lenses to reason about the. Uh, effect of uh, reads and writes on, on a mutable heap. So first I want to point out that these uh, select and update functions that I showed you earlier form a lens between, um, a, uh, between a, a heap and a, pair and, and a reference. 
and the value that that reference st stores. And uh, these are the uh, instantiations for get and put. These get and put are supposed to satisfy certain laws. I'm going to uh, ignore them for now, but you can prove these laws about, uh, about select and update as well. Now, um, what you can do is, uh, is to, uh, to build a, uh, given a, given one of these pure lenses, a specificational lens between a heap and an A and a B, you can build a, um, a stateful lens and a stateful lens is uh, is going to rather than doing only these kind of pure uh, functional updates of uh, of um, uh, of uh, the the um, these the, the the types that are involved in a lens, you can actually do imperative updates of the state of this heap that's going to be maintained imperatively in the state. And an imperative lens would have a signature that looks like this. So rather than a get and put being pure functions, the get and put would be stateful functions, where given an a I can extract a B uh, while, uh, um, uh, and, and I need, the, the pure lens is telling me that in order to get a B, I, I, need, um, I need a heap and an A to get a B, but the heap is maintained imperatively in, this, in these uh, stateful computations. But, with an, uh, but given one of these pure lenses, I can derive a, a, a stateful lens from it. Um, and likewise, um, uh, I can, uh, um, uh, I, I can do the, the the stateful update as well using um, using an, an ST put, and just as select and update formed a pure lens, bang and assignment form a uh, an imperative lens, a stateful lens like this. So you can, if you want, stack these abstractions and program um, uh, against your uh, imperative mutable heap using these stateful lenses. And this is up to you to design. Um, and there's a, a link there that shows you how you can design a library of stateful lenses. Um, so uh, uh, that's a little aside. Now, um, I've mentioned a few times about this language called low star, which is a, uh, I've said is a, a, a shallow embedding of, uh, of C and F star. And uh, I'm going to give you a little demo of that, but uh, uh, I just wanted to say a few words of context. So uh, the, the main idea with low star is that you, um, uh, it being a shallow embedding in, in F star, you inherit the control constructs, the modular structure, the typing discipline, um, uh, the partial evaluation capabilities, everything from the host language from F star is available in low star. Um, and programs that are uh, that are, are uh, verified by F star typically extract to OCaml, uh, but while making use of uh, erasure and partial evaluation and so on to actually get uh, programs that only contain their computational content, not necessarily the proofs. So um, the idea with low star is that if after partial evaluation of your source uh, low star program, uh, shallow embedded low star program, if the extracted program is first order and uh, does not use any you know, unbounded inductive types, like you're not allowed to use uh, lists and trees and so on, then we have a, a tool called this Kremlin compiler. And what Kremlin can do is to take this first order program in this, in this subset of, of F star, subset of, of erased F star, and it can extract this program to C while after doing a few transformations. So by, um, I think I mentioned this also in the first lecture, by translating uh, certain F star types to C constructs that model, uh, that, that, are, that are sort of realizations of these F star models. So, so for instance, um, uh, F star has a library for machine integers that are uh, say uh, UN64. With, with a logical theory that lets you reason about uh, and do uh, computations on UN64 while avoiding things like overflow. And what uh, Kremlin is going to do is to translate every use of this abstract type f star at UN64.t to the C type UN64 underscore T. And uh, there is a type in, in, in low star called uh, array T. Uh, sometimes we call it buffer T. Uh, and uh, we are, uh, and Kremlin will translate that to um, a T star, a pointer to uh, uh, an array of T's. Um, and uh, in the process of doing this, uh, it's also going, to, Kremlin is also going to do things like monomorphize your program, um, uh, compile pattern matches into uh, um, cascades of, of ifs. Um, and it's also going to do things like bundle uh, fragments of your program into compilation units that so that you can control the granularity of, of, of C compilation units that that 
um, that you want to package your program as. So um, that's kind of the uh, Kremlin uh, pipeline in a, in a nutshell, going from low star to C. So I'm going to give you a little demo of this now. Um, while I switch to a demo, is there a question? Or two? Uh, no, no question. I think there was one question, but I think it's resolved. Someone in the chat answered for it again. So I think there are no questions. Okay. So well, uh, uh, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, I couldn't find the uh, memcopy.deps uh, file. Right. So I, uh, I posted a link on the chat. Uh, it's I'm, I'm afraid I, I don't have a link on the course notes. Sorry, but I, I posted a link on the chat and um, you should uh, be able to get the depths file from there. Thank you. So, uh, so this is a, a kind of a, a, a hello world a demo of, um, um, of memcopy uh, in, in Lowstar. So uh, a Lowstar program looks like an F-star program, but it's just written in this, uh, in this effect ST, which is specialized to the, the, the Lowstar memory model. And uh, memcopy is, as you can uh, guess, is a, is a function that is, uh, that's going to try to copy uh, bytes from the source buffer to the destination buffer. And the way I'm going to write this is that uh, it's going to be a, a, a recursive function that is going to take uh, uh, a, uh, uh, both source and dest are um, L buffers that these are kind of uh, length indexed arrays uh, whose length is uh, len, that's some UN32 um, that has, that's a parameter to this function. And the contents of these, these buffers are just bytes. They contain u and dates. Uh, and uh, cur is going to be my, my current uh, iteration index. I'm going to uh, write a recursive function from cur up to len, copying one byte um, each time. So the specification I can write for it is something like, like this. It says, uh, memcopy is, uh, is, a, uh, is, a, is a stateful computation. It may read and write the state. Or, or including allocating and freeing references. It's going to return a unit. It has this precondition and this postcondition. It requires a precondition on a predicate on the initial state. And what it's going to say is that um, uh, I expect the source buffer to be live in my initial state. This is to ensure temporal memory safety. Um, uh, that's, to, that's to say, uh, to ensure that I do, don't do things like no use after free. So in order to read uh, from, uh, from the source buffer and to write to the destination buffer, I require both of them to be live initially. It turns out that I'm going to also require uh, the source and destination buffers to not overlap in memory. And this I'm going to require to be able to prove that my function actually uh, is correct, that I, don't, uh, that, that I successfully copy uh, source to dest. And I have an inductive invariant here that tells me that if I start in a state where source and dest are, uh, their context, contents are prefix equal up to, up to my, my current iteration index cur, then um, uh, that's my precondition. Then what I'm gonna end in is a, a state in which source and dest, their contents agree all the way up to len. So the, this prefix equal thing is, is the thing that's going to kind of specify the functional correctness of memcopy, that at the end of this function, source and dest agree on their contents. Now, additionally, I'm going to say here um, that uh, in the process of running memcopy, the only memory location that I'm going to change uh, are those um, uh, that are present in the destination buffer. Modifies is saying H0 and H1 agree on the contents of memory except in uh, for the locations that are included in the destination buffer. Okay, so that is a uh, a a my spec of mem copy, and I can feed this to F star, and it's going to uh, check uh, against my memory model uh, and uh, the signature of this the stateful effect and so on that uh, that this program is actually correct. And uh, the implementation of it is fairly straightforward. I'm going to check if uh, current is less than len. And uh, if so, I'm going to copy the current byte from source to dest, and then I'm going to uh, uh, recurse uh, moving, uh, 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 moving to the next byte. Now, if I, for instance, if I, if I excluded one of my preconditions, 
and I try to verify this. F star is going to complain here at the point at which I'm dereferencing source saying, I couldn't prove this predicate. I couldn't prove the liveness at that point. Okay, so, so um, if I, for instance, exclude the disjointness condition, then F star is going to complain at the recursive call saying that it couldn't prove the precondition at the recursive call because without this, dis this disjointness condition, my prefix equal predicate is not inductive. Having written to, uh, to uh, the, uh, the current location in DEST, if DEST and source actually overlap, I may have also disturbed some content of, uh, of the source buffer. So without disjointness, my argument here is not inductive. Um, okay. Can I ask you a question about this modifies? Yes. So what happens if, uh, if you run memcopy, but the source and the destination are already equal? What does modifies then mean? Uh, they're equal uh, in what sense? That, that their contents are equal already? I see. Yeah. So in that case, you just don't look at what happens. So it, if, if, it... if source and desk actually point to the same chunk of memory, you will not be able to call memcopy. Memcopy is going to require you to call source and desk with different, uh, with, uh, with different uh, buffers. Um, if, I think may, maybe to interpret your question another way, maybe what you're saying is that you may have two distinct buffers, source and dest, but their contents hap happen to be equal initially. And you're going to copy source for the contents of source to dest again. And this is in a way a, 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 a no-op. Um, uh, then what does modifies dest mean in this case? Well, modifies dest means, in this case, it means that you wrote to, uh, you wrote to the destination buffer. Um, and this prefix equal condition is, the post condition is going to tell you that it's going to tell you the, the values that you wrote to that destination buffer. And in this case, it's going to tell you that the, the values that you wrote to that destination buffer happen to be the same as whatever was present in the destination buffer initially. Did that answer your question? Yes, thanks. Yeah, uh, Nick, there's, there's another question in the chat. Yeah. Uh, would Kremlin compile this function to its own C function, or is this a model of C's mem copy so that uh, Kremlin would call, I mean, Kremlin would compile calls to this mem copy to uh, C's mem copy? Uh, in this particular case, this is, uh, this is Kremlin will actually compile this. Uh, and uh, this this is what you get out of Kremlin in, in this case. Uh, so um, here, uh, notice what happened here is uh, that uh, all the all the proof all, all the specifications disappeared. Uh, all the preconditions and postconditions and stuff disappeared. There's no runtime overhead purely to writing these specifications. What's left is the the computational content of the of the code, and it's just a kind of a, a direct transcription of this of this recursive function here. Um, this is kind of a, I, it's a naive way to write mem copy in, in, in our tool chain. Uh, it's, uh, you know, there's um, uh, uh, some other ways in which you would write it. So the first thing I would do is I, I wouldn't write it as a recursive function. I would write it using a looping combinator so that, uh, that, that our libraries provide so that what you get in the end is a, is a for loop, not a recursive function. So that's one thing. Something that you could do that's a bit more sophisticated is is instead of writing memcopy as a C program, as, as a low star program here, you could write memcopy as an assembly program in Veil, extract it to assembly and call it from uh, low star. And we have actually a model of interop between low star and Veil. So you can get a, uh, an efficient implementation of memcopy in assembly and call it from your C program. Um, you could also, and maybe this is the question, the original question, if you really wanted to call C's memcopy, what you could do in F star is to just, is to uh, essentially declare that mem copy is an extern. You can give it a type uh, that you claim is the type of, of C's mem copy and just call it from your low star program. So you have, the, uh, there are several options available. Does that answer the question? Uh, I, I think it does, Lex. Yeah, I think I have yeah. another question and and a comment. First, the comment is that I wouldn't bother to uh, rewrite 
tail recursive functions into loops because all the C compilers was talking about optimize natively tail calls. So in assembly, it will be as good as loop anyway. Uh, that's that's a good remark. Uh, the uh, and in the case of mem copy, that's that's probably okay. Um, although that said, it, it depends on where you're trying to uh, deploy your code. There's uh, um, uh, we actually the, the clients of Lowstar actually care about the C code the way the way that it comes out, and in many cases they have requirements that, for instance, you are not allowed to do recursive functions at all. Period, and they don't like to see recursive calls in their code. And in which case we often have to write rewrite our code using uh, using loops. But for memcopy, I agree. It's uh, I mean, really to do memcopy properly in 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 low star, you would um, either link with uh, a a uh, an existing memcopy or you would write memcopy in bail and call it from um, from low star. Yeah, because victorization. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, still, uh, my question out of curiosity. Uh, there in the MCP spec SRC and DST have to have the same lens. Yeah. And yeah, I'm curious, do you have uh, like automatic correction from bigger, uh, this buffer to a smaller one? Because, yes. Yeah, technically DST can be bigger than SRC. Yes, yes we do. So notice the definition of LAN L buffer is that Len is a lower bound on the length of the buffer. So, and this is expressed as a refinement. So if, if dest happens to be bigger, that's fine. I can still use it at a type where it's length, uh, the len parameter is smaller than its actual length. Yeah, thanks, cool. Um, so, so now I can write it, you know, just to illustrate some more, some more features of, of, of low stars, just and, and to emphasize that uh, memory management can be just manual. So uh, what I'm going to do here is to write a, a function that's going to call memcopy. And what it's going to do is um, it's going to uh, uh, operationally, it's going to malloc a new buffer, copy a source into dest, free the original buffer, and return dest. And it, it, you know um, what I really wanted to illustrate is that you know malloc and free are available to you in, in low start. And, uh, uh, the type of uh, this this function is going to say, well, I require uh, source uh, to be live initially, and Lowstar also exposes a, a predicate called freeable. I need to be allowed to free source. So, for instance, uh, uh, you know, uh, so this freeable predicate is going to tell you, for instance, that that source points to the beginning of an allocation unit that was given to you by the underlying allocator, uh, so that you have permission to free it. Because you can't other, you can't you know if I uh, not all pointers are freeable because the, you can, you know, you have to pass to the to the memory allocator uh, the the pointer to the base of an allocation unit. You can't pass some other pointer to it. So freeable is telling you that source is indeed one of these pointers that you can free. And then what the spec is telling you is that uh, in my post condition, I'm going to give you a fresh buffer a dest, meaning dest was unused initially in the initial state H0. It's live in the final state, and for all uh, indexes less than the length the value of dest in the final state h1 is equal to the value of source in the initial state h0. And um, the only buffer that I modified in the initial state was source. And in fact, the way I modified it was that I uh, deallocated it, that modifying the address of a buffer is to say that you, you may have deallocated that buffer. So that's, um, uh, that's a, um, a, 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 a spec and implementation for, for this piece of code. And uh, again, you can ask Kremlin to extract this, and what you'll get is, um, sorry, um, I can't see the bottom of my screen. So Zoom has taken it over. Uh, uh, what you'll get in, in, in Kremlin is a function that calls um, uh, a malloc and a, a free, and then a call to the mem copy that I, um, uh, that I defined above. Okay, so uh, that's my little low star demo. Is there other questions about it? Uh, yeah. yeah, building on top of the mem copy example, um, can uh, or low star handle tricks like 
casting multiple uint eights to a machine word to optimize the copy, or does the type system kind of get confused by that behavior? Um, so um, you, we uh, let me think about this. Um, we do not let you do that. We do not let you cast between a uh, a uh, an array of uh, say uint eights and an array of uint thirty twos. This I, I believe this is undefined behavior in C. Oh, okay. Uh, so if you wanted to do such a thing, you can, but you'd have to drop into bail, where we, where we do play such tricks, because that's assembly language and we have full control. Okay. Yeah, another question. Um, essentially, with this variable SRC and yeah, lock other and the allocation, Basically, we're uh, talking about ownership. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Are there more kind of high level ownership primitives and notions in Lowstar? So Lowstar uh, does not have an ownership uh, uh, type system. It's uh, it's best, it's description. The, the the discipline that we use to verify Lowstar programs is a kind of a whore, a whore logic with a uh, with a uh, a framing discipline that's called, um, uh, you can read up about this if you like, it's called implicit dynamic frames. Basically, you do not assert, you cannot assert in low star that you have exclusive ownership over a piece of memory. Instead, what you say is that you, you have privilege to use a piece of memory and you describe what you did with it by saying, for instance, that you modified it. Um, so if you have uh, two pieces of code that are you know, yeah, you're, that are uh, trying to use um, uh, a piece of, uh, you know, a shared resource, then um, uh, uh, then you have to re you have to make use of these modifies clauses to to notice that maybe some some procedure that you called did not uh, disturb your invariance on some some disjoint piece of memory. So this this is uh, um, this liveness, disjointness, and modifies clauses kind of work together to to confine write effects on memory. Uh, that's that's how we do framing in, in low star. Tomorrow, I'm gonna to teach you a little bit about how we do separation logic in F star. And that gives you a, a, a very different mechanism by which you can uh, describe ownership and um, uh, framing and, uh, and even some concurrency. Right, thanks. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, how does Kremlin, uh know how to model the heap uh, in C or like how to treat uh, L buffer as arrays in C? So uh, so L buffer is just an abbreviation on top of, as I showed you, on top of this abstract type that we have in F star called, uh, in low star called, um, just, that's called buffer. It's an abstract type and it has a, a model um, uh, in uh, uh, in this uh, as part of the low star memory model, it's got a it's got a model that tells you that it is a uh, it's it's implemented as a reference to a sequence with various operations on it that that allow you to treat it as if it were an array in in, in low star semantics. So what Kremlin does is it uh, for these uh, specific abstract types like buffer, it is going to extract them to C arrays because it has special knowledge about these abstract types. What we've done is on we have a proof on on uh, on we have a model on on paper that's the, that's also in the the course notes a link to an ICFP paper in 2017 that's formalizing low star, where we say that for these abstract types like buffer that provide an interface to um, uh, to read and write uh, uh, indexes into a buffer, that it is sound to model this using arrays in a semantics that. Uh, that corresponds to concert C light. Um, uh, but this is a proof that we did on paper. We have not mechanized this proof. So Kremlin has special knowledge of these types and will translate them to arrays. Um, uh, that's part of the primitive behavior of Kremlin. Okay, thanks. Uh, Nick, there's, there's a question in the chat. Uh, mm -hmm. It says, uh, in, in the malloc copy free, in the enjoys clause, uh, why do we mention that uh, the source uh, buffer is only modified, not freed. We could say unused in H1, right? Instead of saying modified. Ah, uh, uh, so 
this actually this uh, speaking about the address of a buffer, th this is really saying that it's it's saying that it's free. To be honest, when you say that you modify the address of a buffer, it means that you may have you you have totally destroyed the buffer. It does not it's not live anymore. Uh, unused in uh, so unused in. I, ca I cannot actually prove that that source is unused in H1. Unused means that this location has never been used. So uh, once a location has been used, it can never again become unused. Um, so um, uh, we do okay. not model address reuse and so on. Okay. So so let me move on. Actually, I, there's um, I'm about forty five minutes in, and I want to keep going. So. Um, uh, if you have time at the end, I'll come back to the questions and uh, maybe um, and, and continue in the chat. So, uh, so low star has been used in many different places. There's, there's, we have hundreds of thousands of lines of verified code developed in low star, and it's deployed in in, in a number of places. Uh, as I mentioned, at maybe in the first lecture, in the Windows kernel, in the Linux kernel, in Firefox, and so on. Um, the uh, you know, what I sketched to you before diving into the demo was a simple memory model where I had this kind of monolithic heap where I had type references into a, into a heap, but there was just one large heap object. But in fact, what we do in, in, in low star is to, under the covers, we have a richer heap model than even the one that I ske that sketched to you, where what we have is a, a kind of a, a, a region-based memory model that is structuring the heap into, uh, that is structuring the C heap and, and the C stack into a number of regions that are arranged hierarchically, and uh, you can use this this uh, this abstraction of the C heap and stack to sort of structure your invariance. For instance, you can say, "I'm going to place certain objects in 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 a particular memory region, and some of my other data structures are residing in a different region." And this is going to tell you, through the structure of this memory model, that these two data structures don't overlap with each other. Um, uh, so. Uh, uh, yeah, we, the, the the underlying memory model is 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 richer than what I showed you. Um, this I mentioned a bit about already. It's uh, the the main principles that we have in a, in low star to reason about this about state is this implicit dynamic frame um, technique. Um, and this too was a question. So you know, uh, so I think I covered this as well. So, so certain libraries have primitive support like like array. Um, and uh, these these operations that we expose in F star get primitive treatment in Kremlin. Uh, but what I wanted to get towards here was that uh, was that you know you can certainly program and prove code directly in low star, and and we do that often. Um, but proofs can are are can be quite hard. You have to think about you know uh, uh, the memory footprint of every one of your operations and uh, show that they don't overlap with others and so on. But uh, rather than writing low star programs directly, some of what we've been doing recently is to uh, is to um, either to meta program low star. So for, for instance, there's, we have a uh, there's a recent project called um, Hackle times n, where Hackle is a high assurance crypto library programmed in F star. And uh, in a recent uh, a paper, the authors of Ac of Hackle showed how you could use meta programming to write. Uh, a crypto primitive once, but to meta program it in such a way that you get n implementations for different um, platforms using vectorized cryptography. Uh, sorry, ve vectorized primitives to get, um, uh, uh, yeah, to so that you 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 know you don't write the low star code by hand. You write it once and you get uh, sort of five implementations for free. Um, uh, and another thing that we do is we, we sort of build further proof-oriented DSLs on top of low star so that we're not writing low star again by hand. We're writing other uh, descriptions in, in other languages that can then generate low star for us. F star can do a proof about the low star code and then we can extract C code from it. And one such uh, DSL that we have is called Everparse. And Everparse is a, is a uh, parser combinator library. I'm gonna to switch to a different presentation to tell you about that. So, um, how do I get Zoom keeps taking different parts of my screen? Okay. Um, so, um, uh, Everparse is a um, uh, 
a verified parser generator uh, that we use in various uh, security critical applications. It's uh, actually the main Everpass developer is uh, my colleague Tahina Ramanan Andro, uh, but there's many of us who, who contribute to it. Uh -huh. And one of the things that we've been looking at with, with, with Everpass recently is um, how to harden existing pieces of, of, of C code uh, by using uh, verified parsers. And part of the motivation here is that um, uh, improper input validation, uh, incorrectly handling attacker-controlled inputs is, is one of the most common causes of uh, uh, software security flaws out there today. Um, in fact, a, a DARPA project uh, recently estimated that something like 80% of all um, software uh, security flaws can be attributed to uh, improper input validation. And MITRE rates input improper input validation is the third most common uh, weakness. Uh, and in fact, even the, 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 the most common one, um, which is cross-site scripting, you could also see as, a, um, as an instance of improper input validation. So what we've been looking at is trying to find ways in which we can, we can make use of verified parsers to ensure that programs in validate their inputs correctly. Now, uh, this is particularly prob problematic in low-level code where people are trying to write parsers and validators in C and C++ for performance reasons and so on. But any error that you make here is catastrophic due to um, lack of memory safety. Now, uh, I wanted to sort of emphasize that uh, improper input validation kind of occurs at, at all levels of the stack. So while you may, you know, the, the, the common impression is to think of it as you're, you have a program, it's getting some uh, untrusted input from say a network and, uh, uh, and you, know, you, you need to make sure that you properly parse the, net, the packets you receive off the network. And that's certainly a, a common case of, uh, uh, of, of um, making sure that you do input validation correctly, but it happens at everywhere in the software stack. So if every time you cross a trust boundary, for instance, when you're crossing between a guest and host partition deep inside a, a hypervisor, uh, there too, uh, you need to do input validation correctly. So, and, and, uh, so at, at, at all levels of the software stack, input validation is, is, an import, is an important problem and difficult to get right. Um, so the reason it's hard to get right, I think these days is that there's, it's a combination of problems where, where many input formats are just uh, specified and uh, are, are uh, the formats are bad in some sense. They're very, uh, they, they admit uh, too much ambiguity and um, uh, the parses that people write against it are, uh, uh, they're themselves uh, uh, tricky. So, uh, and maybe they're hand-rolled and, and, and difficult to, to, to get right. And many uh, sort of uh, uh, widely publicized um, security instances are really instances of bad parser, uh, bad parsing, including things like Heartbleed. Uh, so, while I think there's kind of an industrial trend away from away from hand rolled formats for for new applications, there's there are libraries like Protobuf and um, Captain Proto and Bond and so on. Um, these kinds of uh, and, and it's good to use these these tools that are uh, moving away from handwritten parsers, but these tools are not really designed for designed for um, for malicious inputs. Not all of them, at least, and uh, you don't you don't get um, uh, formal correctness guarantees out of them. So, for instance, this is one a, a, a recent uh, um, uh, library that uh, called Captain Proto that uh, is designed to be sort of give you uh, efficient uh, parsing, uh, but the it's it's really not designed for use in um, uh, in adversarial scenarios. Uh, despite them being quite you know um, careful about how they. Uh, um, uh, how they, they position their work is not really meant for use in an in, in adversarial setting. Plus, there are still many legacy formats that you, for which you can't use one of these new parser generators. You can't use Protobuf, for example, to parse some legacy format that is, uh, uh, for instance, that, that Windows has, or even if a format is prescribed to you by, say, the IETF, like there's a particular wire format for TCP packets. And that is sort of set in stone. You can't uh, replace your TCP header parser by something that you're going to generate from Protobuf because the wire format is dictated to you by some uh, external source of truth. Um, so yes, 
uh, this is the instance of, a, for instance, a TLS client hello, it's, the format of it is specified externally in some RFC. So what Everparse is, is, is a tool that is targeting uh, this domain. It's, it, our goal is, uh, our, our kind of, uh, our long-term goal is to abolish writing low-level binary format parsers by hand. And instead, what we're aiming for is to let you specify formats in a high-level declarative notation and to auto-generate high-performance, low-level code to parse binary messages from these descriptors. And uh, the code that we produce is, is C code, and the goal is for it to be easily integratable in existing code bases um, in a variety of languages because we produce a verified uh, low-level C code. And the, the main selling point of our parse is that our code comes with formal proofs that uh, are uh, both that our formats, the message formats enjoy various good proper properties, notably, for instance, that the message format itself has uh, some notion of things like non-malleability. That is that the, the parsers and the serializers are mutual inverses of each other. So a message that you receive on the wire can represent at, at most one high level message that the application is intending to exchange. So. Uh, uh, we also, um, uh, our generated code comes with, with proofs, aside from proofs about the format, the code itself is proven to be memory safe, arithmetically safe, uh, functionally correct, meaning that it parses exactly those messages that conform to the high level spec. And we actually also prove that our code is free from double fetches. So meaning that as we validate the contents of an input buffer, we're going to read each byte of that buffer at most once, preventing things like time of check versus time of use bugs. Um, so the way Everparse looks uh, is we have several front ends that are uh, targeting F star, targeting subsets of F star layered on top of low star that are designed to generate uh, high performance parsers. So one of these front ends is a language that we call 3D for dependent data descriptions, which is a language that has, uh, that resembles the, uh, superficially at least, it looks like a language of, of C structures and unions. So I can define a, a structure in, in 3D that says, uh, you know, uh, this is the, the representation of some wire format of some message where I have four fields, all four of them are UN32s, um, but I can decorate these structures with semantic constraints like the stuff in blue that, is, that are kind of like refinements um, uh, uh, constraining the legal values of each of these fields. I can also attach to fields imperative actions that are like parsing actions. So as I'm parsing, you should think of it as this structure is describing the layout of some uh, message in memory. And as I validate the contents of, of, uh, of, uh, um, of a message, I'm going to check uh, these constraints as I go through. And once I hit this max field and I successfully check this constraint, I'm going to run a particular imperative action to say populate a parse tree. So that's the input language of, 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 ever, of ever parse. From that input language, we generate F star code, both a specification of these formats, as well as a, uh, a, an implementation of, of uh, parsers for those formats. And in, once we generate that, we get, uh, F star does a proof that the code that we generate satisfies these properties, that uh, the parser and the serializer are um, mutual inverses on valid messages. And, um, and having done that proof, we can then, uh, the, the proof is about a piece of low star code. So then we can just ask F star to extract the, the parsers that we generated as C programs from Kremlin. And what we get is safe, high performance, low code, uh, low level uh, C code from our low star program. And these, the code that we generate can actually be pretty fast. So, so for instance, um, uh, in the case of, uh, in this case, for instance, when generating parsers for a particular kind of signature, our verified parsers can be, you know, uh, several times faster than, than existing non-verified handwritten code. Um, what we've been doing with Everparse is since, um, uh, since, yeah, since about a year ago, well, we've been using Everparse inside um, Microsoft's Hyper-V product. It's a, a uh, hypervisor and um, it's the core isolation technology used in the Microsoft Azure cloud. And there, there are components inside Hyper-V that are uh, virtualizing um, the interface to uh, the network. And every network message that passes through this interface 
some of its headers are um, first uh, parsed and validated by, by EverParse to ensure that um, uh, ill-formed messages do not um, pass between the untrusted guest and the host. We also have validation in the other direction, uh, ensuring that uh, guests do not get confused by potentially uh, ill-formed messages that the host may pass to it. Uh, aside from hardening applications in C and C++, we've also been using EverParse to build other verified applications in FSTAR. So, um, uh, so for instance, we use EverParse in building a, um, I'm just going to pick one of them. Uh, uh, there's a, a uh, there's this protocol called DICE, which is a, um, a measured boot protocol for IoT devices. And part of what the system has to do is to issue um, uh, certificates to a, a device uh, to, uh, to um, certify that it has been uh, loaded off of a known good um, system. And those certificates are generated by Everparse and proven to be uh, correct. Um, we also do this for um, things like uh, our uh, communication protocols like Quick and TLS and so on. In, and in all cases, producing uh, verified high performance C code. So I'll, uh, I'll pause there for a second before telling you a little bit more about the language. Do you have any questions at this point? Yeah, uh, there's, there's one question. So mm -hmm. uh, does the verification here contribute to the performance? Like there's a C code that's generated, can that be optimized by GCC or, or some other compiler maybe? Uh, yes, uh, so I think um, uh, the verification definitely does contribute to the performance. Uh, it's, um, uh, but I think, the way it does so is is not so much because the uh, we generate code that can be optimized by by a, a C compiler. Uh, it's more that uh, the the validators and uh, parsers that we generate are um, uh, you know are uh, we make use of optimizations in the in the low star code that our that our library produces. So, for instance, uh, let's say you want to. Uh, uh, all our operations operate in place. So, for instance, you know, if you want to, uh, if you parse a a, uh, a buffer that contains some structured message, and you want to read the 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 third field from it, what we're going to let you do is we're going to just uh, rather than copying the contents of that buffer into a struct in C and then letting you access the third field, which is going to be expensive because it's going to incur a copy. What we're going to do is to let you read the buffer in place by saying, if you want to give me the, if you want access to the third field, Everpass will give you a combinator that says, okay, you can read my buffer at offset, um, you know, whatever it is, the computed offset of, of that field, and uh, we, because we have proofs that this corrected this computed offset is is correct, you can read directly from the input buffer without doing any copies. So it's these kinds of things because we have uh, uh, proofs uh, sort of uh, backing us, we can give you more um, uh, sort of aggressive interfaces uh, to uh, the input buffer that you might not otherwise do in C. Uh, other reasons why our code is fast is because we do a lot of partial evaluation. We, uh, before we emit the, co the code in um, uh, to low star, F star is going to uh, unroll loops in some cases. It's going to um, uh, in, do a lot of inlining. Um, uh, so you're going to get sort of, uh, yeah, you're going to get sort of very, very tight uh, um, a code that is that is meta programmed from F star in, in a way so that, uh, um, yeah, meta programmed for efficiency. Uh, I hope that answers some of the questions. Okay. So, so the optimizations are in the step from low star to C, is that right? No, the optimization uh, uh, the optimizations are in the step from from F star to um, uh, the uh, uh, they happen. The optimizations happen before the code reaches Kremlin. So all the so so part of the reason is that um, as I mentioned earlier, the Kremlin tool is 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 not verified. So whatever we try to do in Kremlin. We, we try to keep it relatively simple. So any optimization that needs to happen on your code is done in F star prior to reaching our backend. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, there's, there's another question. Uh, so uh, the ASN1 notation, I am not sure how to say it, but it's 
I'm assuming it's ASN1. Yeah. Yeah, the ASN1 notation is used as a standard for some communication protocols, but uh, they have different optimization parameters which determine the way the ASN1C compiler finally compresses or generates the serialized format. Is there a way in which these optimizations are encoded into EverPass? So we do not yet have a, 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 uh, uh, a full support for parsing ASN1 in EverPass. In fact, this summer we have uh, uh, an intern, uh, a student, Halbin Ni, who has worked, uh, who's at MSR at the moment, working on such a thing, a, uh, a uh, Everparse support for ASN1. Um, uh, yeah, but we don't have full ASN1 yet. Okay, so uh, there's another question. Um, so, what's stopping us from verifying Kremlin? Like, is it uh, is it a matter of time, or complexity, or are there like technical or theoretical limitations? Uh, I think it's a. Uh, in principle, it should be possible to do. I think uh, uh, part of the difficulty is that you know you want a. Uh, 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 you want a, uh, uh, you know, you'd have to work against a, a, a semantics for C that is going to be, you know, you'd have to take, say, concert C light and uh, work against that formally. Uh, I think it's it's totally doable. It's a question of uh, uh, time and uh, and uh, an investment. It's not a, it's not a trivial project though. It will, you know, Kremlin does a number of things like. Uh, um, uh, say uh, the doing things like monomorphization and so on uh, will will require uh, some non-trivial work to prove correct. Okay, okay. Uh, there's there's one last question. So uh, can Everpass support NDNS or other uh, bit level specifications? Or it does. Know? It does. Yes, oh. we do support uh, bit fields and NDNS transformations and so on. Yes. Okay. Good. Those are all the questions. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, so um, uh, here is a a a, uh, a sample spec in in uh, in Everparse that uh, there's there's a few ingredients that go in, into our source language for Everparse. So there's uh, there's uh, based on a, on a on a uh, the baseline is is C structures and unions, and on top of that we layer semantic constraints. Like the, the stuff in blue, the refinements on individual fields, um, and support for variable length structures and a notion of imperative actions. So this is uh, uh, this is a simple example of um, uh, refinements on fields. We also support um, uh, 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 untagged unions. So in C, often you, you will you may write something like this. You may have a, a union that has three cases. And uh, you may have you may package that union into some other struct where there's a tag, perhaps next to the union, perhaps somewhere else in, in scope, where the tag is going to tell you what the case of the union is, except the relationship between the tag and the union is left totally implicit in the C program. There's, there's no formal connection between the tag and the union. Whatever pass lets you do is to make this connection explicit. So you can instead of writing a union, you can write in Everpars what we call a case type. And you're going to uh, you're going to uh, write uh, you're going to parameterize this union by a tag. You're going to case analyze the tag, and in each of the cases, you can have a different type. And when you write the message, uh, you can write a kind of a, a sort of a dependent product where you write a, a, a tag, and you can parameterize the tag uh, the the message union by that tag. And this tag need not be adjacent to it. It can be any expression in scope that you can use to instantiate the, the message union. Um, uh, we have support for things like variable length fields. So uh, another a common pattern in in in, uh, in C programming when you're dealing with variable length structures is you um, you have some you you have a structure where its first field can be uh, a byte length, and its second field will be a zero length array uh, that the program will then interpret as being uh, you know uh, a a dynamically allocated array whose size is byte length. This is common idiom in a C program, um, but you know we don't like to leave this kind of thing implicit. In in uh, in Everparse, you you will specify this relationship between the byte length and the variable length structure explicitly by these annotations that we have that let you say that the the byte length of this array is exactly this expression in scope. Okay, and um, 
and this language can be, you know, uh, this language of, of, of constraints and variable length things is, is quite expressive. So you can say, well, um, I, I can write a type that's parameterized by some uh, uh, total message length. And I may have a byte length field and an offset. And I could say in my specification that I first have some padding. And the size of that padding is can be computed as uh, this expression using the offset. And then what I'm left with is a variable length array whose size is that, but all of this message, uh, this entire message must fit inside this total message length. And you can write constraints like this. Um, you can also attach to, um, to a, a, one of these, parser, these, these message specifications, a uh, um, like parsing actions. So for instance, you can say, you know, after having validated this content of this, of this message, I'm interested in the field of the, in, in the value of the max field and maybe the max field only. So what you can do is to attach an action here that says, well, um, write the value of the max field into this out parameter out. And these imperative actions will be executed by our parser. Um, uh, and this can get quite fancy. So, you know, sometimes you have data formats that, uh, where that are laid out in a way that, you know, um, uh, well, I'm not going to go with this one in detail. You, some of the, these message formats that we see in practice are, are really brutal and they involve several layers of uh, variable length structures uh, laid out discontinuously. And you can, um, uh, you, can, you can specify this kind of thing in, in Apple Parser. Uh, but in the end, you know, what we get is C code, which is uh, generated to be uh, aiming to be sort of human readable and also human patchable. A lot of this may sound surprising to some of you. So uh, 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 unlike a, um, a uh, so, uh, other parser generators where you generate code and you, the, uh, the code is not meant to be human readable, uh, in our scenarios, we are deploying code inside um, existing critical code bases. And these code bases, they, um, uh, they have to be uh, patchable in, in an emergency. And people need to be able to read and maintain the C code in case of a, a security incident and so on. So the code is generated to be human readable and human maintainable in an emergency. So uh, if someone needed to patch the code on the fly, they're they are able to do that. And they can also, the, the code is designed so that you can step through it in a debugger and, and so on. Um, so there's a lot of work goes into producing code that is, uh, um, uh, uh, that, that looks as though it were um, manually, uh, like human human written. Uh, we've done this for uh, our experience in, in Hyper-V so far has been, we've maybe, uh, we've, we've tackled maybe more than a hundred message formats so far. Um, uh, I think this number, we've, we've managed to shrink our spec a little bit. Our spec size is a bit smaller than this now, but we generate about 30,000 lines of verified C code for, um, um, for these, uh, uh, hundreds, hundred plus, uh, message formats. And, uh, one of the constraints that we had to satisfy was that um, the uh, we're inserting these new uh, parsers on uh, these uh, high performance critical code paths, and our performance uh, goal was to be uh, was to have less than two percent measured performance overhead when integrating these verified parsers, two percent cycles per byte overhead um, by adding verified parsers, and the result was that our uh, our overhead fit comfortably in this 2% budget. In some cases, we, our code was actually more efficient because we could avoid some, copy, some copies that were happening in the existing code because our verified code was actually proven to be um, uh, to have properties that, that would allow us to uh, avoid such copies. Um, so I have about 10 minutes left. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip a little bit to, uh, to telling you um, how how we actually model these these parsers and and serializers. So uh, so first at the level of the specification, we we have uh, a definition of what a parser is. A parser for a type T is a function from bytes that's a sequence of u into eight to uh, an option of a of a of a T that's the parsed type uh, the, the parsed value extracted from the bytes and a natural number which is going to tell you how many bytes were consumed with the following property, oops, um, that uh, it tells you that, uh, so this property tells you that if you have 
if the parser succeeds on two input bytes, um, and if the parsed value is the same in the two cases, then the, uh, the input bytes were also the same. So it's kind of an injectivity property on the parser. Okay. Uh, and the serializer is then is a, a serializer is indexed by a parser. And a serializer is a function in, in, in the opposite direction from T to bytes. Notice that the parser is partial because the parser can actually can can of course fail if you give it an uh, an it'll form bytes. But the serializer says if you give me a type T, I'm a value of type T, I'm going to produce some bytes such that the bytes that I produce is going to be successfully parsed and successfully parsed to the same value that I serialized. Okay, that's the inversion of a part of a serializer to a parser. So these things are just pure specifications. Uh, they're, they're, they're pure functions in F star. This is not the code that we want to execute. Instead, what we're going to execute is a, um, is uh, we're going to write low level code uh, for say uh, the, in this type called validator, where a validator is going to be proven to be equivalent to a, uh, to, to a particular specificational parser. And, uh, and the way, the type of our validator, it looks like this. So it says a validator is indexed by a parser and its type says that if I'm given a, a buffer of, of bytes and a claimed length for that buffer, then the validator is a stateful function, a low star function, just like the ST functions I showed you earlier, that's going to return, uh, if it successfully uh, validates the contents of the buffer, it's going to return the number of bytes that were consumed, such that if the uh, input buffer is live in the initial memory, then this function is not going to modify any memory. It's just a validator. And uh, if, it's, if, it's, if it uh, successfully returns um, uh, some, uh, some number of bytes that were consumed, then the number of bytes that were consumed are going to be ex exactly the same as the, this, the bytes that were consumed by the parser. Okay. Uh, right, so that's... Um, so, so, so this, so we're going to write programs in a combinator language for validators. And these, uh, since validators are in the specification of, uh, are in the monad for low star programs, these programs can then be extracted to see. So to give you an example of it. So let's say you have a, a very simple struct. That's just a, a, a pair of two fields. You're going to, def our tool is going to generate a specification in, in F star for, uh, that's going to say, this is just a, what it means to correctly parse a, uh, an employee record with two fields. This is pure code um, to, uh, uh, as a specification for employee parser, but it's, it's actually going to be generated in a combinator language for parsers rather than writing uh, these, these kind of uh, parsers by uh, you know, just very manually. We're going to work in a combinator language for parsers. And then we're going to generate validators for those parsers, and we're going to work in a combinator language for validators, rather than uh, explicitly writing functions that are going to read an input buffer and then advance a pointer and so on. We have combinators that allow you to validate a pair um, by validating the components of a pair. And uh, these combinators are proven correct once and for all. And once you have that, then from these combinators, you can just partially evaluate them after they've been verified. And what they reduce to after partial evaluation is, um, is, is code, is first order code that can be extracted by Kremlin to a parser that just looks like this, this, uh, the C function that's going to call a validator, check if it succeeded. If it succeeded, then call the next validator. And if that succeeded, then tell, tell me how many bytes were consumed, but otherwise fail. Okay, so um, uh, a, a quick demo of that. I think I have time for a demo uh, in a couple of minutes. Um, so um, to give you an example of that, uh, here is a specification in 3D of the format of a of, of a TCP header. It's got a number of uh, a number of fields, a number of bit fields. This is maybe answers a question about you know support for bit fields. So. Uh, TCP header formats have bit fields in them. It has variable data, variable length data at the end, and so on. And you can write this in in three um, D in uh, a, a description that looks like this. And when you ask F star, when you ask the F star uh, ever pass to compile it, it's going to produce a um, an F star program that looks like the applications of a bunch of these combinators to to uh, 
to validate a TCP header. And then finally, when you, uh, when you um, get um, uh, F once F star verifies this thing, you can compile it to C. And what you get in the end is a C code that looks like this with comments and with, uh, you know, uh, names that match the source syntax and so on that are passing a, a TCP header, uh, including things like bit field constraints and, and, and so on. Uh, and so finally, what you integrate into a, uh, a, uh, an, a, a C program is a call to a TCP validator that's, that's a, a C function with a signature that looks like this. And the, um, when you want to validate a TCP header in a C program, you just call this and it comes with a proof that it's, it's uh, memory safe and correct and double fetch free. So I'll, I'll stop there for now. And uh, I think we still have a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, there, there are no new questions. Uh, yeah, I think if anyone wants to unmute themselves and ask, they could go ahead. Okay. Um, um, maybe I missed this, but um, uh, in what language do you develop this uh, F sharp uh, uh, system? Uh, in you mean F star itself? What is it developed yeah. in? F star is programmed, is programmed in F star. It bootstraps. Okay, so you have uh, two compilers of it: the, the 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 starting one and and uh, self written, right? written in the language itself. What was the 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 initial one? The initial one. It initially bootstrapped in uh, in F sharp a long time ago, and um, and now it bootstraps in. F star compiled to, um, uh, but uh, the compiler is written in F star. It uh, it extracts to uh, OCaml, and then we use the OCaml runtime. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I think this is kind of a, the 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 main message of this this particular talk was that you know write low level code if you must. And sometimes you're, you're forced to because of, uh, you know, you have to run inside a kernel or something, but program it tastefully in a proof assistant, not directly in C or assembly. And then if you think carefully about the, uh, uh, the, the coding patterns that you have, then um, you can build abstractions inside your proof assistant using, you know, uh, uh, structures familiar from functional programming, things like lenses and parser combinators and monads and so on to structure both your programs and your proofs. And uh, this can, in the end, reduce the overhead of actually building uh, low-level verified code without compromising things like performance. So with proofs, you can be more daring in the kinds of uh, uh, optimizations you attempt. And with partial evaluation and so on, the resulting code does not need to pay any, penal any penalty for, these, uh, for the structure that you imposed. So that's, that's kind of my high-level takeaway. All right, so that today I actually finished on time, so I'm happy about that. Um, I so just want to say that it's very impressive uh, what you've done here. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah. So about this ever parse, um, the, the, it generates uh, the F star code, and you verify this. So you don't verify that it generates provable F star code. That's or... right. It's it, it's uh, um, uh, the ever the ever parse to uh, this kind of this front end language three D. The translation from three D to F, to F star is uh, is the the proof there is by translation validation. We translate to F star and then do the proof there. We do not prove that the three D to F star compiler is itself correct. It's a translation validation style rather than certifying. Um... Okay, thanks. So uh, were there any bugs uh, found in the tools you, in this ever parse tool, for example, during your deployment? 
like well, since you well, since you since you prove only the generated specification were there mismatches between the 3d specifications and what was generated by this ever parse compiler maybe were there were some interesting no so so i think the the um so uh in the process of developing Everparse parse well, and this 3d compiler we you know uh uh the the 3d compiler is untrusted so you know you can make a bug in there if you like but it's not going to get past the f star compiler so that's part of the you know uh, i don't know if you if uh, uh it's uh, the the this uh, there are many names for this things like uh, proof carrying code and so on you know you you're you're free to to attempt all kinds of uh, you know uh, potentially unsound things in 3D, uh, but F star will catch you. So uh, uh, then so there have been cases for sure where you know I've uh, implemented things in 3D that um, that I got wrong, but they never went past F star. Okay. So I had a question. Um, I think in the starting of the lecture, you were talking about like the pre last yesterday's example, we were using integer to represent the state. Yeah. And in the example we covered today, you were representing the heap, like a memory model of a heap in yes. which, so as we modify the heap, we have an implicit notion of a state getting changed. Correct. Um, yeah. Now, but, and there are specific actions by which the values within the heap can be modified. Correct. How, yeah. So my question is, um, what if we have a notion of a finite state machine in mm -hmm. which there are explicit actions which move from state one to state two? Yeah. Um, is how would we be structuring that? Yeah, that, that's that's a really interesting question, and uh, it's something that that you can do. And uh, so so one thing you can do is to say, um, let's say. Uh, uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm going. You can model your state as uh, you have your state machine. Let's say your your state your state machine has I don't know five states, mm -hmm. and you're you're going to um, uh, represent this these five states as a data type in F star, just an enum with five states in it. Okay. Maybe these states have some payload, in which case you may attach some payload to it. Um, but let's say you have some some uh, some some representation of all the states in your state machine. Then you you can say okay, I have a a um, a state transition system. That is going to be, uh, you know, the uh, you can describe it, for instance, as a um, as a relation among states. And then what you can do is to say uh, instantiate your state monad with with this representation being this uh, um, the, the type of uh, you know your, your enum of five states. And what you can do is to actually uh, there is a variant of the F star state monad in in the paper I linked there. This uh, it's a popular paper called uh, "Recall a Witness." It's also linked on the on the course notes. What you can do with, with that with that setup is to say, "It's I'm going to have this this um, uh, I'm going to represent my state using my enum, but I'm further going to constrain the, the enums to evolve according to a uh, a uh, a reflexive transitive relation corresponding to the transition system of your state machine." And then F star will ensure that when you when you uh, uh, when you try to update the state, that you only do it in a manner compatible with the state machine, the state machine's transition relation. Okay. So um, uh, so so that's one thing you can do. The other thing, you, uh, maybe a simpler thing, maybe I uh, maybe I went to, a, to, a, to a, an answer that's maybe more complex than it needs to be. Uh, a simple thing you can do is to say I have my uh, my uh, uh, my five states, and I'm going to expose actions that let me, you know, update the state from um, A to C. If this is it, and and from say uh, C to the final state, if these are the if these are valid transitions in my system, but I'm never going, I'm not going to give you an action to validate from uh, to update the state from A to B because maybe I don't want to allow you to do that transition. Okay. I'm not sure. Uh, I wish I had a whiteboard to sketch some of these things, uh, but uh, you can we can talk more on Slack if I wasn't very clear. Yeah, I I, I think uh, I'll re I'll read up the paper that you mentioned and then I'll reach back reach out to you on Slack. Okay, thanks. Thank you.
Okay, uh, thanks, Dr. Swami. <laughs> um, I, um, I created some breakout rooms if you guys want to uh, go to them and talk, you know, in smaller groups, or you can hang out here, still uh, ask questions. Um, Patricia will start in 12 minutes, what I have. Thanks, Jim. Uh, yeah, I'm around if uh, folks want to chat uh, or look at more code or anything. Yeah, in particular, there are a couple more interesting questions in the chat. The last one uh, asks about, yeah, since uh, this 3D language to have start translation is not verified, would it be possible to you know, produce uh, embedded F star code out of 3D spec, and if it's a concern in practice. No, I, 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 this is not a concern in practice because the the point is for this this compiler to be untrusted. So as long you know you can do whatever attempt to whatever you like in a, uh, uh, in a in a 3D spec, but uh, in a translation from 3D to um, well. Put it this way: the the, uh, the specification of a uh, a three D type is is its translation to F star. So, if you're able to produce a validator that, uh, uh, I mean, if you try to produce an incorrect validator, F star is going to notice that you produce an incorrect validator. So, the where you may get things wrong is if the specification, when you translate it from, you know. Uh, uh, the, the part that you have to trust is the statement of the theorem that that three that three D produces in F star. So after the translation from three D to F star, you should read the statement of the theorem that three D produces in the end. And if you're convinced about the statement of that theorem, you don't have to trust the rest of three D because the proofs are checked. On the other hand, if if the if you misread the theorem that three D produced. And you accepted a theorem that said, you know, for instance, maybe I wrote some uh, very interesting type in 3D, but 3D translated this type to F star as just unit. And what you will get in F star is a parser for unit, but this will not be the parser for the type that you intended. So you should read the theorem that you got in 3D in F star at the end to make sure that the type that's being parsed is not a parser for unit and is in fact a parser for the type that you cared about. If you if you if you if you do that and you convince yourself that the that the type that you care about is indeed the type that was produced in 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 F star, then you do not have to care about the validator because the validator was verified. Uh, can I just add to that? Can you hear me? Test yes. Test? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, right. So so that was basically the question. So the the sort of compiler from three D to F star is not verified. That that's okay. And but it could, as you said, it could generate. So you still need to manually sort of uh, confirm that the theorem that's specified in F star does what you want, yes. right? Yeah. And is this practical to do in purpose? For example, for the TCP example, I don't know how big that F star uh, theorem was, but is it practical to do these things, to confirm them by hand? Yeah, because you, what you need to do is to, uh, is to convince yourself that the type that you produced in F star is a is a uh, you know is a record type that contains the fields that you that you expect, and it is I mean we do this we uh, we uh, we generate C code from it we look at the type that it was produced we check that the statement was the one that we expected. Um, the the complexity is in the generation of the validators, not in the generation of the parser spec. Right. The the theorem. The theorem. Um, but the uh, theorem that's sorry, there, I guess there's a lot of echo. I'm wondering if that echo is due to me. I'm trying to see if I can maybe mute my microphone, and that's going to help you reduce your echo. Or maybe you can type the question. The, the theorem that 
that three D produces says something about the type, but does it say anything about the format? That like the binary format, other than that, you round trip. So that's so all. That's you, you need to know that the the that the um, the uh, so to, so the, to check that you actually valid, correctly parse the wire format is um, is a uh, uh, is an experimental thing. There is a wire format that is in, in an injection with the uh, with the parser type, but the actual wire format that you see on the wire is uh, to see that if that you correctly parse that is uh, there is no there is no specification from it aside from the three D spec. You see what I mean? That that the wire format is specified in a bunch of informal documents, RFCs and. Uh, uh, other design documents. There is no formal spec for the wire format aside from the 3D spec. But you can by hand or by eye uh, verify that the parsers, which are declarative and readable, do what you expect them to do, right? And I guess you can run this code and just see whether it parses. Exactly. Messages. Exactly. So and that's part. I, I, I see that this is the place where testing verified exactly. code comes into play. Exactly, because you you that's a, that's exactly the point I was trying to make. There's an interesting discussion in Slack about it. You have a bunch of uh, informal documents describing what this this uh, uh, you know this. Uh, a kind of a the, the the state of the world is in some sense like you know, describe the, I expect to receive these messages on the wire in this format but that's a totally informal specification it's in English and uh, we have formalized that in a language that has a, that for which we give a semantics in F star but we need to confirm that whatever model we built for it actually conforms to reality and for that I don't see another way to do it aside from testing it seems like the 3D spec is, or maybe I'm misunderstanding something. It's, it seems like it would both specify kind of like an in-memory type that your parse, that the parser is parsing into and a binary format. And it seems like the, the type is like the in-memory type is, is referenced by the theorem, um, but the binary format, like maybe you could write code that takes in a 3D spec and create some statement about the binary format. <laughs> To include in the in the theorem, so the statement of the binary format is the parser for that type. It is saying, you know, here's the type, and the, the binary format is the parser that is going to interpret the bytes on the wire as that type. That is the wire format. Got it. Thanks. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a it's a kind of a thorny question. I mean, may, maybe you know something that we could do is to say, or you know. We could generate a rather than the parser being the wire format. You could say, "Hey, you know, maybe we'll generate some other description of a wire format that is uh, independent of the parsers, um, and um, and then prove some property that you know relating that that uh, that wire format to the parsers." Um, but this 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 wire format, whatever we produce, would still be something that is produced from three D. It wouldn't, you know, uh, maybe you could do a, you could have some independent source of truth, like have somebody else produce this wire format. Um, uh, but ultimately it's an object that does not have an a priori formal spec. Uh, 